it is a remarkable fact that today's timekeeping system was inherited from the earliest recorded civilization. Sumer. The distant culture preserved the method of reckoning time by the calculation of periods of 60 seconds, 60 minutes, hours, and days from an even more remote society that once thrived before an immense cataclysm popularly known as the Great Deluge brought an end to these advanced thinkers. The Sumerians were in fact a remnant extension of this forgotten people, for it is noted by historians that the Sumerian stone records make no mention of any other lands of origin, and the places called Sumer and Akkad were not even known to the earliest inhabitants. The 60 base or sexagesimal system was preserved by the occupants of Sumer after this catastrophe, adopted by the mysterious Akkadians and again later copied by the Babylonians, from which it was dispersed everywhere. The Sumerians recorded their chronologies meticulously, dividing their cultural history between regnal years of kings that ruled before and after the flood and those that exercised kingship uh, throughout, throughout the Near East after Sumer was fragmented. It is one of the more enigmatic of the Sumerian king lists that is the focus of this study in this video. A 4,000 year old record of eight kings that are very cryptically referred throughout all Euphratian texts as the seven kings whose reign ended dis disastrously with the great flood. This 4,000 year old text reads, When kingship was lowered from heaven, kingship was at Eridu. Eridu Alulam king reigned 28 1,800 shars. Alogar reigned 36,000 shars. Two kings reigned its 64,000 shars. I drop Iridu. Its kingship to Badtabira was carried. The shar is a unit of time that is that has absolutely perplexed scholars. Because historians have not detected any obvious reasons for asserting that the Shar is anything other than a standard year, they have uniformly designated it as a year, effectively rendering Sumerian annals to the stuff of mythology. The Shar year theory makes these kings to have lived lifespans of tens of thousands of years absolutely untenable. Another very misunderstood aspect of these annals from Sumer Accentuating the problem of falsely assigning these records a mythological status is that the Sumerians wrote that their kingship was dropped from heaven, as will be shown. This is a precise astronomical phenomenon experienced by the Sumerians that will prove astonishing in coming videos. The eight kings and their reigns are as follows. Two kings form the Eridu dynasty. Alulam, 28,000 shars. Alagar, 36,000 shars. Three kings formed the Badtabira dynasty. Enmen Luana, 43,200 shars. Enmel Galana, 28,000 shars. Dumuzi, 36,000 shars. One king make, makes up the Laric dynasty. Incipiziana, 28,800 shards. One king reigned in the Sipar dynasty. Enmen Durana, 20, 21,000 shards. One king ruled in the final the final city of Shurapak. His name is Ubar Tutu, 18,600 shards. The Sumerian text reads, Five cities were they, eight kings reigned there, 241,000 shards. Then the flood swept over, over the earth. After the flood had swept there over, when kingship was lowered from heaven, kingship was in Kish. The traditional conclusion of the Shar year theory will lead to the ca will lead the casual observer to conclude that these kings ruled successively for a period of 241,200 years, and that one king alone in Minluana ruled 43,200 years by himself. This interpretation is simply untenable. Not only untenable, it is ridiculous. Though there are hundreds of historic references in the annals of antiquity to the incredible longevity of the antediluvian pre-flood people and the even longer lifespan of the giants, we cannot hold to the possibility of kings living to reign for periods of 43,000 years and more. It's ridiculous. Our very earliest confirmable stone tablet records extend back to 2200 BC and dates prior to this are subject to such conservative analysis, they are usually assigned to the realm of fable or they're assumed anachronistic. The answer to the Shar mystery lies none other than in the book of Genesis. 
prior to its inclusion into the Hebraic scriptures, Genesis 1 was already a very old cosmological record that, that the Jews copying from Babylon, copying sources from Babylon, had taken it from another source without citing their source material. It is a curious creation account that was used to prefix the other Genesis texts. In Genesis 1, the very first mode of timekeeping introduced was from evening to morning being the first day. The Antediluvians recorded time by the passage of days. This was simply because the world before the flood was biospherically different than the world today. The present axis tilt inclined toward the plane of the ecliptic, the sun's equator, did not exist in those days. Earth experienced no variation in temperatures because of a dense mesosphere of moisture that trapped heat and effectively dispensed light and reflected away harmful radiation due to a perfect vertical 90 degree axis that allowed Earth to orbit the sun in 360 days as opposed to our slightly lower rate of 365.25 days today. Without seasons before the flood, there was no reason for the ancients to ascribe any importance to the passage of years or orbital periods. Genesis 2 explains this biosphere perfectly in revealing that in those days prior to the flood, there was no rain. Only a mist watered the earth every morning and evening. This is what one, one would expect to find under such a pristine tropical climate beneath a thick marine canopy above. This is biblically referred to as the firmament above. It is identical to the planet Venus's situation today. There is an ocean on the surface and an ocean high in the air. The traditional relic of factoring the evening as coming before the morning has survived in modern holiday traditions such as New Year's Eve, All Hallows Eve, Halloween, Christmas Eve, Midsummer's Eve. It was the Eve that marked the new beginning. Hebrew reckoning marks the Eve as the start of the day. When the sun goes down, it begins a new day. The darkness is always before the light. The day as a unit of time is appreciated much in the regulation of festivals and feasts, and in the Book of Jubilees, we find the measurement to determine lifetimes was only counted in days. I'm going to repeat that. In the ancient Book of Jubilees, which is at least over 2,000 years old, we find that the measurement to determine a person's life was only counted in days. They did not count them in years. The records of the Sumerians themselves dispel the Sharyar theory and reveals the origins of our present timekeeping system used around the world today. Thousands of cuneiform tablets have been excavated and translated that show precise tabulations of sunsets and moon rises, a system of measurement linking Genesis 1 to ancient Sumer. So meticulous were the Sumerian calculations that they divided the day into 86,400 seconds with 24 hours and 60 minutes each, each having 60 seconds each. The numbers 6, 60, and 600 were of extreme import to them, and they were aware that their 60 base system was one-sixth of the circle of the 360 degrees of a per perfect ring that they had designated after the original orbital period of the Earth around the Sun before the deluge. The sexagesimal system truly linked time with space and unified terrestrial periods of measurement with astronomical periods involving this planet's movement and relationship to other objects that are moving within the solar system. Now, with the shar being a single day, an evening and morning, the 241,200 shars of the Sumerian king list becomes 670 years. I'm going to repeat that again. It becomes 670 years because it's on a 360-day count annular orbit. You simply divide 241,200 shars by the number of days in a year, 360, and you get eight kings or seven kings ruling 670 years. Throughout this work, these Anuna files, this 360 day year will be referred to as the draconian calendar and an epithet affixed to this system because the antediluvian pole star was Alpha Draconis. It was not the present folk, folk pole star we have now in Polaris. We find now that the longest reign of a king was 120 years or 43,200 days. With this revelation, does a mystery unfold. In calculating the first six reigns of the king list, we find that each one is divisible perfectly by 120 days, while the latter two are not. The average reign was 84 years, while the shortest was only 51 years before it was cut off by the flood. The length of 120 years seems to have become a standard theme in many Sumerian Babylonian epics and histories. 
Just as there is a year and a greater counterpart astronomers refer to as the Great Year, so too does it appear that in ancient Sumer there was a Shar, which was a day, and then a Great Shar, which was 120 years. Incidentally, 120 days is a third of the draconian year, and a third of this is a biblical generation, which was 40 years. The king list record lies at the heart of many mysteries that will be revealed in this, in, in this series. It is a history involving unusual kings ruling from a pentopolis of cities. Seven kings who enjoyed full regnal terms before the flood cut off in the reign of the eighth king. This is a Sumerian version of the final 670 years of history before the flood. By the time of the height of the Greek dominance of the old world, the Shar had already been forgotten as a calendrical unit of time measurement, but a fragmented memory of it remained. Plato wrote in his Timaeus and Critias that Earth's earliest traditions span back 120 centuries. Curiously, on the other side of the world in remote America, the Salaugi, or ancient Cherokee Indians, believed that 120 years was the limit of human longevity, a number associated with those that were called keepers of the fire. Let it be remembered that God in Genesis gave Noah 120 years warning before the flood, and Moses lived exactly 120 years of age. During the period of Greek expansionism and innovations in the arts and sciences lived a Babylonian historian priest of Bel named Barossus. He was also referred to as a Chaldean astronomer. It was about 270 BC. He wrote an extensive history of Babylonia and Greek, probably during the reign of Antiochus II of Syria. His histories were made unique because he had exclusive access to the oldest Babylonian archives and he was able to read the ancient cuneiform. Un uh, unfortunately, his works have not survived, but fragments of his books have been recorded by Josephus, Tatian, Eusebius, Pliny, Vitruvius, Syncellus, Apollodorus, Abedinus, and Apollohistor. The cuneiform texts studied by Berossus were centuries old, some over a thousand years in age, which were merely copies of even older texts. Barossus even boasted that he had access and had studied original inscriptions of the beings that preceded the appearance of mankind on earth. These were they whom the Babylonians called the Anunnaki, and they will, sh and, they will uh, it's, and they will shortly be the focus of this calendrical study. Because of transliteration problems, language risk, corruptions inadvertently introduced into the copies made from older older books or older rough stone records or, or vellum and clay tablets of the histories preserved by Barossus, some of his conclusions were slightly corrupted, but even the corruptions allude to the correct interpretations. For example, the Babylonian zodiac is supposed to have dated back from the time of Barossus exactly 6,700 years, which is actually an exaggerated 670 years of the older Sumerian king list, which concerned an ancient calendar. Further, Eusebius' celebrated church father calculated Barossus' chronology of Babylonia to span back 2,100 Oh, uh, actually, 2,150,000 years. But this sum merely exhibits its confusion between the Shar being a year or a day. The actual records reveal that, it was, that 216,000 Shars, or days, and not 215, or well, 2,150,000 of them was exactly six, 600 years. This are draconian years of 360 days each. Eusebius could have been attempting to isolate the even greater sum of 6,000 years, which is 2,160,000 shars. But we have problems with Eusebius and Barossus when, when, when conveying different number systems. They seem to have embellished quite a bit, adding extra zeros where none belonged. Also of note is that the other king lists have been found, some being Babylonian versions of the older Sumerian records. One such list of pre-flood kings numbers seven kings and is known in the British Museum as Tablet W20030, with the six of the, with the six of the seven kings equated with the Sumerian list. This disparity may be due to the fact that only seven regents finish their reigns, the eighth having his rule interrupted by the flood. Another king list preserved by Barossus and cited by Alexander Polyhistor mi mirrors the, the Genesis genealogy of ten patriarchs, having ten antediluvian kings who ruled collectively for 120 shars, or 43,200 days. Sitchin, Zechariah Sitchin, was wrong. There was no 432,000 year period. It was 432,000 shars, or turnings, or evening to mornings. And this 
is exactly 1,200 years on the older 360-year day count calendar used by the Sumerians, the ancient Egyptians, the early Olmecs, the Vedic system of the early Aryans, and the Maya, and so many others. From the descent and first appearance of the Anuna in the year 3439 BC, with arrival of Enki, who we know as Enoch, was exactly 1,200 years to the Great Deluge in 2239 BC, which was the 670th year and final year of the Anunnaki Nephilim dynasty of the Seven Kings. If you want to know the real history of Nibiru and the Anuna, the Anunnaki, you cannot learn it in books that put out disinformation. The data is available in my book, Anunnaki Homeworld, and again, reiterated and, in, and with more data included in Return of the Fallen Ones, and again in Nostradamus and the Planks of Apocalypse. Or, you don't have to buy these books from Amazon. You can continue to listen to these videos. I'm going to reveal everything. But these three books have Anunnaki revelations not published anywhere else. My dear listener, with this video, we built a coffin. That coffin now stands open. We have set these facts that, that have been corrected into this coffin. But this video doesn't cover it at the all. The very next video is going to put the nails in this coffin. We're going to put to rest this disinformation about these 432,000 years and these impossible lifespans of Anunnaki. Now, the next video is fascinating. We're going into more detail. This is basically an introduction to what I'm about to reveal. In the informative book, Discovering Ancient Giants, written by William Henson, we find the Sumerians' history, histories in text after text. Whenever the starting point was recalled, it was always this, 432,000 years before the flood, the, Ding, the Dingir, the gods, then came down to earth from their own world. Now, Henson's statement is mostly true, save for the inflated 432,000 years for the misinformation that has saturated the genre of books published on ancient astronaut theory, we have Zechariah Sitchin to thank. Sitchin's belief that Nibiru's orbit was 3,600 years derives from a mistake. That the deluge occurred in the 120th Shar induced Sitchin to multiply 3,600 years by 120 to produce 432,000, quote, years, unquote, from the arrival of the Anunnaki to the Great Flood, an error even Vedic chronographers made in determining the duration of the Yugas, the world ages. A pre-flood year was 360 days. The calendrical systems of all ancient third millennium BC civilizations was 360 days a year. Thus, a decade a unit of 10 was 3,600 days. The Shar was a term describing a day and a 100-year period, 120-year period. The historically recorded 10 Shars from the descent of the Anunnaki to the Great Flood was simply 120 years times 10 for a period lasting 12 centuries, 1,200 years. This 1,200 years multiplied by 360 days of the draconian calendar is 432,000 days. Sitchin's mistake was a simple one, but it expanded Anunnaki history from 12 centuries until a cataclysm to almost half a million years, an untenable duration. Anything that is alive that lived as long as 432,000 actual years would be something totally different by the end of such a long period. It is a span of time that would make even major events within it to be of no significance. What significance is the Great Flood, which didn't kill everybody in the world, in a time period of 432,000 years when we know from geology alone that 10 different Great Floods happened in that time, at least. Sitchin's other error was assuming that Nibiru had anything to do with the Great Flood Cataclysm in 2239 BC. It did not. And as over 30 of my videos mention or reference and show in chronology and in chronography, that event was caused by the Phoenix Phenomenon. Just as the Shar was a unit of time measuring 120 of something, 10 Shars being 1,200, so too did the Gar measure distance in length. A Sumerian gar was 12 cubits, so 10 gar would be 120 cubits. 
Sitchin knew this, but still pushed the 432,000 years because it fit with his own belief in the evolutionary model, in uniformitarianism, and the Ice Age chronologies of establishment academia, which are bogus. They're BS. There are also rumors that I have not verified yet, but there are many people who believe that Zechariah Sitchin was paid to put out this misinformation by very, very, very uh, rich, agenda-driven people. Sitchin noted that the Sumerians held in high esteem the sum of 3,600 shars, or perfect circles. This shar term also meant completed cycle. He assumed that shars referred to years, but shar had also another connotation, that of a king or supreme ruler. This introduced the added confusion of the manifold traditions of the ten kings before the flood. Babylonian historians wrote that the ten kings of the pre-flood world ruled 432,000 shars. Zechariah Sitchin knew this and still didn't correct the misinformation. He was too invested in his own theory, which tried to support the model of anthropology that humans developed over long periods of time. Barosus wrote that the ten kings reigned 120 shars. Again, Zechariah Sitchin had read Barosus. He knew this. The ten kings are associated by many with the ten patriarchs of Genesis text from Adam to Noah, the survivors of the flood. The shar concept is preserved in Genesis where we learn that Noah was warned 120 years before the flood that it was going to transpire. The biblical Noah meets his parallel in the Phoenician Oranios the Greek Uranus, according to the 10th century B.C. historian Sankuniathan of, of Phoenicia. Now, Sankuniathan, one of the earliest historians that we know to date, 3,000 years ago, wrote that Uranus was the son of Autochthon. In Plato's writings, this Autochthon was one of the ten kings of Atlantis, a quasi-mythical realm that was destroyed utterly by a flood cataclysm. The ten kings figure prominently on some versions of the Sumerian king lists. Not all the king lists are just seven kings. There are some that have been found in the British Museum that, that feature ten kings before the flood. These ten kings, shars being 3,600 days, equaled 120 years, or a great shar. A shar was 3,600 days, or ten antediluvian years of 360 days each. To Sitchin's credit, Barosus, as cited by Abedinus, did make a mistake. He, Abedinus wrote, Now, a shar is esteemed to be 3,600 years. Excuse me, Abedinus is quoting Barosus. Sitchin used this as his evidence, despite everything else that he, he, had, con he had come in contact with. But Barosus wrote of things already lost to memory in the 3rd century B.C., 2,000 years after the Shar Day system had collapsed. Now, Puranic texts that were also accessible to Zechariah Sitchin, and he quotes them in his, uh, uh, his uh, series of books, uh, Puranic texts of the ancient Vedic Sanskrit read that there were four Earth Ages totaling 432,000 years. The actual composition of the Puranic records was about 1500 B.C. So the misunderstanding between days and years in the older Sumerian Shar system is quite understandable. It is remarkable that the Sumerian and the Vedic records cite the same number, 432,000. Now, Sitchin further assumed that the 120 shars of Sumerian history to the deluge was 432,000 years, a ridiculous sum, because Joseph Brady in 1972 wrote that a Jupiter-sized planet with a theoretical orbit of 1,800 years, which is exactly half of 3,600, would explain discrepancies in Halley's Comet orbit. orbit. Sitchin saw this as proof of his shar year theory. He linked an untenable theory, which is Nibiru, to an untenable idea that people could live 432,000 years and wrote the Earth Chronicle series. My position is that the Anunnaki descended in 3439 BC, and I will show this, which also my books affirmatively demonstrate, which was 600 years after the capture of Luna in 4039 BC and 600 years before the start of the Anunna Nephilim dynasty in 2839 BC, which was exactly 600 years before the Great Flood in distant antiquity. 
It is my contention that the 432,000 years interpreted by Sitchin and mimicked by so many others are merely days on a 360-day annual calendar. And in my books, I offer the proofs that these 432,000 shards concern a 12-century long period, only 1,200 years, making the descent of the Anuna before the great flood to be 3439 BC, for we have shown the dating in over 30 archaics videos, we have already shown that the great flood of the biblical fame was in May of 2239 BC. Note, here are just a few references. The Vedic Puranas explain that the Kali Yuga Age, the Dark Age, was a period of 1200 years. This is in the Vedic Puranas. I didn't make this up. The same Vedic Puranas also say in a different passage that this was 432,000 years. But the original text must have said 432,000 turnings or units of time because they are very specific earlier in the Puranic Vedas that this Kali Yugi age was 12 centuries. Well, 12 centuries and 432,000 days is exactly the same on the draconian 360 year uh, uh, 360 days a year count system this is evidence they preserved actual history while remaining confused as to the chronology babylonian records of the antediluvian world specifically refer uh, to a distant period involving the Anunnaki of 1,200 years involving the gods now here we have babylonian records mentioning 432,000 years or, or units of time in shards, and then also mentioning a 12th century period. The early Arabians believed that they had an ancestor king before the flood who lived 1,200 years exactly, King Shedad bin Ad, the founder of civilization. In my other works on the Phoenix, we have seen numerous chronological proofs that the Great Flood occurred in 2239 BC in the month of May. Simply adding 1,200 years to 2239 BC gives us the date 3439 BC as the appearance of the Anunnaki. Factored another way, Josephus 2,000 years ago wrote that Abram was born 292 years after the flood. Rashid, about 1,000 years ago, wrote that Abraham was born in 1947 B.C. of our calendar. This is confirmed by chronologist Stephen Jones, who also concluded that Abraham's birth was in 1947 B.C., but he did not cite Rashi. He used the Old Testament and the, chron chron the chronographical markers in the book of Jasher to determine his 1947 B.C. dating for the birth of Abraham. Now, with the date of the Great Flood being 2239 B.C., or a Phoenix Reset year, and the descent of the Anunnaki 1,200 years, or 432,000 days, earlier at 3439 B.C., right when the Genesis narrative has Enoch appear. But in Sumerian timeline, it's Enki. We have two different belief systems that occur here. The 292 years before the birth of Abraham, 1947 B.C. plus 292 years of Josephus is 2239 B.C., the dating of the Great Flood. Twelve centuries before that is 3439 B.C. And according, and according to two different historical narratives, one Sumerian and one uh, Hebraic rabbinical, we find, and in one, the gods descended and arrived, their first appearance, their first appearance being, uh, 432,000 units of time before the Great Flood, which was 12 centuries, 3439 B.C. In the other narrative, we have in the book of Genesis, in 3439 B.C., easily seen in the chronology of the Ten Patriarchs, we have the birth of Enoch, who we know of as Enki. In the Hebraic records, the Watchers, the Anunna, descend to earth in the days of Jared, whose name actually in Hebrew means descent. Being in the tenth jubilee, which was the first descent before the great flood. A second group of Anuna arrived later, also before the flood. The descent of the watchers is the central theme of the book of Enoch, and the name of Jared was a commemoration of this event. 
This descent does not mark the first appearance of the Anuna, but the arrival of the most important figure in the old world's human histories, Enki. Even the Genesis chronology shows this to be the exact time Enoch is introduced into the biblical narrative. Enki of Sumerian records is the same as Enoch of the later Semitic traditions. The Sumerian records read that Enoch descended to earth. It literally says, when I approached earth, there, is, there was much flooding. Now, in the Hebraic book of Jasher, we note that at this precise year of 3439 BC in the chronological narrative, the Gihon River flooded and killed a third of mankind. The Gihon is the Nile in Egypt. Its identity revealed by the Jewish historian Josephus, Flavius Josephus, almost 2,000 years ago. Enki himself landed in the Snake Marsh among the Gizi reeds. This is a marshland before the flood known today as Giza, where the Great Pyramid stands. This monument is also alluded to in the Sumerian text, for it was there that Enki built his house, called Eabzu, or the House of the Deep, his sacred precinct in Eridu. This links the Sumerian Enki to the biblical person of Enoch, for which many non-canonical and other documents assert was the builder of the Great Pyramid Complex. Interestingly, additionally, Eridu is the biblical Irad in Genesis that was built by none other than Enoch. The book of Jasher reads that in the days of Enosh, the Lord caused the waters of the Gihon to overwhelm them, and he destroyed and consumed them, and he destroyed a third part of the earth, and there was no food for the sons of men, and the famine was very great in those days. This disaster in the time of Enosh is confirmed in the Jewish Haggadoth text, which relate that this was a terrible flood before the great flood of Noah's day. The Yazidas of, of Asia preserve traditions of a flooding more ancient than Noah's, stating that the world was flooded twice, the second flood far worse than the first. A long tablet series found in the ruins of the Sumerian city of Nippur is, a, is the source of the text which reads, When I approached the earth, there was much flooding. This is a text narrated by Enki referred to as the Eridu Genesis Collection. We have here an ancient Sumerian narrative of the arrival to earth by Enki that occurred 1,200 years or 432,000 shars before the Great Flood, which would date his descent to earth in 3439 BC. Coupled with this from independent sources like Jasher, we have a terrible flooding, same the Enki witnessed, occurring in Egypt, killing a third of humanity. Two separate sources telling the exact same story. In the biblical chronology of Stephen Jones' work published in his, in his, in his research, The Secrets of Time, the flooding of the Gihon is perfectly dated at 3439 BC or 1200 years before the Great Flood in 2239 BC. A Christian fundamentalist, Jones knew nothing nor published anything about planet Phoenix or its chronology. He knew nothing about it. That the background of these Enochian Enkite traditions was ancient antediluvian Egypt is made more profound when we consider this next piece of chronological evidence which comes entirely from Egypt. The 3439 BC date is found perfectly in the chronometry of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Astronomer Royal for Scotland Charles Piazzi Smith in the 1870s determined on site by research and measurements that at Giza, that for reasons unknown to him, the monument was designed using the descendant passage as a scope to point directly at the star Alpha Draconis, the Eye of the Dragon, in the year in our calendar 3440 BC, which he said was the pre-flood pole star. This 3440 BC date is a virtual bullseye for 3439 BC. The Great Pyramid was built by Enoch, Enki, which is the subject matter of my book, Lost Scriptures of Giza, and 14 of my Archaic's videos. 
Using scripture to interpret scripture, a method of paramount import to the Christian apologist, we read in John 3.13 a very mysterious statement. It says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. We are led to believe this was referring to Jesus, but it would be equally true of Enoch because the biblical records make it an important event that Enoch ascended into heaven and was never seen again. This is none other than a biblical admission that Enoch arrived to earth in descent before he again ascended to heaven. Enoch Enki is a major player in the early affairs of civilized humanity, and many more videos and posts are coming concerning this fascinating individual. What is intriguing is that the apocalyptic revelation prophecies record that in the last days, a third of mankind shall die at the appearance of a celestial object in the sky called Wormwood, though 200 million demons that scour the earth at the same time are perfect images of what the ancient Babylonians perceived the Anunnaki to be. Not the Sumerians, who consistently exhibited the, the Anuna as tall, bearded Caucasians. Further confirmation of this arrival in 3439 BC comes from Babylonian tradition of, of Oannes. Oannes created man, according to the Babylonians. He was a bringer of civilization. This identifies him as an Anunnaki. He is also the father of metallurgy a very unusual fact since no metals of any significance have ever existed in Mesopotamia. Now, Oannes arrived 1,200 years before the Great Flood. Ignatius Donnelly, concerning the beliefs in Oannes, wrote, This is clearly the tradition preserved by a barbarous people of the great ships of a civilized nation who colonized their coast and introduced the arts and sciences among them. In every instance, the first appearance of the Anunnaki coincides with natural disasters. Now, the Anuna are the reason we saw in a prior video that civilization just suddenly appeared in the 35th century BC, marveling and basically perplexing the, the academia of today. Those of you who have followed all of my Great Pyramid video series, this video here should not come as a shock to you. You already know that Enoch and Enki are the same person. I am providing in this video further evidence outside the context of the Great Pyramid. Two different traditions talking about the arrival of Enki and the, and the appearance of Enoch and what happened at that time period. Now, this great celestial body that the Anunnaki are attached to is not the phoenix. There are no correlates between the Anuna and Anunnaki history and the Phoenix phenomenon. There are none. There is a celestial object that, re, that re, it, it, does, it does cause great destruction. Now, many of you don't want to hear about Nibiru. You don't want to hear that a Nibiru might exist. And I don't know if it was called Nibiru or not. That was Sitchin. Sitchin made that up. But what I'm going to show you is that there is a celestial object out there the dark satellite, which has nothing to do with the phoenix. And every time that it appears, Anunnaki either suddenly appear on Earth or they depart. This, I'm going to provide you the exact chronology for this, just like I provided you, provided you the phoenix chronology. I have waited over a year and a half to release this Anunnaki chronology because it's shocking. It, it, it has everything to do with the last days. It has every, it is it is the reason why Phoenix will be here on May, you know, May 16th in the year 2040. Six years later, this object's coming too. Its history is undeniable. I'm going to show it to you year after year after year. The exact mathematical pattern that shows over 5,500 years of world history perfectly all the way up till 2046 when it will come back again. As, as seen by Nostradamus and dated by Nostradamus, as even shown by Mother Shipton. It's coming back. It's the real death bringer of the Hopi. And it's another, it, it, they will, this chronology will, will be revealed in the Anuna files. But to sum this video up, uh, it seems that the more we study the pieces of the past, the more we find advanced Humans mistaken for gods upon their arrival among among a primitive people. This does not negate the importance of prophecy and end times and the things that are happening. It just it actually empowers them. It takes these 
these concepts and this phenomena that we research in the ancient past and it basically materializes it in, into our frames of reference that we can understand and we and we can more readily we can more readily predict outcomes based off past predicates because we know what really happened as opposed to this mythological crap that other people have foisted upon us like Zechariah Sitchin and all his followers and the and the followers in ancient Babylon the priesthoods of Babylon that contorted the earlier Sumerian writings so much disinformation has completely made us blind as to what's about to unfold in the next 40 to 55 years. It's very fascinating. The study of the archaic past is paramount because what transpired of old is destined to unfold again. The socio-political scenarios, environmental, spiritual, are all a part of a patterned weave, a repetitive history. The evidence that our ancestors knew of the approach of a civilization-ending cataclysm and made efforts to prepare for it are found everywhere in the annals of antiquity. It would be foolish of us to ignore these traditions, warnings. We hold that we are the first technologically advanced civilization on this world, but we are very wrong. One of the more controversial writers of our time, David Icke, in 1995 wrote, Planet Earth was hijacked, taken over by another civilization or civilizations, which are highly advanced technologically. It is from some of our neighbors in the fourth dimension that the interference has come, manipulation, via either thought control or direct intervention. Of all the Anuna, only Enki, Enoch, sought to preserve mankind. The Anuna had erred in their genetic engineering. Attempting to create docile halfwits, they introduced too much of their own DNA. Humans had become too wise, too intelligent, and too industrious, so an attempt to destroy mankind with a plague was made, but Enki intervened. A famine was caused, but again, Enki intervened. In 1994, Dr. Arthur David Horn, Ph.D. Physical Anthropology at Yale University, 1976, wrote that the Sumerian god Enlil's chance to rid the world of humans now came in the form of a foreknown catastrophe, what we would later call the Great Flood. Those familiar with my Phoenix chronology videos and books will know that the antediluvian world experts were not caught by surprise by the global cataclysm for the orbit of the phoenix object was already known enlil informed the anuna that a killing flood was coming but regular humans were not told and by humans i am referring to the adamu the name of mankind in those days horn wrote that it also makes sense that a long-lived race like the Anunnaki would be aware of the cycles of the universe, such as the movements of comets and other extraterrestrial bodies. Enlil insisted that the news of this approaching calamity be kept away from humans. All the Anuna were sworn to secrecy in a committee, but Enki cleverly devised a way to inform his favored human, Zasudra. For this deception that benefited humanity, when it was discovered by the other Anuna, Enki then became the serpent, a deceiver not of humans, but of his own people. The serpent in all the old tales was mankind's benefactor, an outlaw among the gods. This data further serves to identify Enki as the person of Enoch who predicted the flood in all the pseudepigraphical and apocryphal writings. This also reveals that not all antediluvian writings and stories were recorded by humans, the Adamu, but after the cataclysm, either someone from among the Anuna wrote these things down, or they dictated them to normal humans who later preserved them on stone tablets for us to discover. The rift separating the Anunnaki from Enki was much more than their disapproval with a single person of Anuna pedigree. Enki led an entire faction of powerful Anuna. The oldest and longest enduring traditions agree upon a very intriguing fact. In the beginning, or before the deluge cataclysm, the gods were already divided into two groups. The Vedic, Aryan, Hurrian, Amorite, Nordic, Germanic, Persian, and Greek, all branches of the Caucasian race, maintained traditions of two groups of gods in antiquity that were in direct opposition to each other, and the source of that condition, condition, contention excuse me, was mankind. 
This fact necessarily leads us to another disturbing fact about the pre-flood world that will be fully expounded upon throughout this series. The earliest cultures around the planet after the sudden demise of the Neanderthal and then the Cro-Magnon peoples were all river-dwelling people of short stature with black hair and black eyes and brown, olive, or red skin, smooth skin with no facial hair. These, these people were spread about in the five great river valleys of the world, known later as thriving civilizations. These, they were concentrated in the river valleys of the Nile, in Egypt, the Tigris Euphrates, Sumer Babylonia, the Indus Valley, the Harappan Civilization, the great rivers of China, the Yangtze River, and across the Pacific in the Urumbaba River Valley of South America. These dark peoples all share a common belief system that is well documented, that is well, very well documented. When the gods appeared on earth, they were tall, blue, and green-eyed, grew long facial hair, and had white skin. To the antediluvian peoples of a post-apocalyptic earth, many centuries after a prior civilization fell, the gods were Caucasians. Two groups of Anuna, a civil war, both sides Caucasians. Both groups guilty of DNA manipulations and the creating of designer Homo sapiens sapiens. Designer DNA programs carried out to create separate Homo sapien races. Anuna supervised mining and labor settlements. Homo sapien population explosion then out of control. One group still able to move in and out of this holosphere containment field at specific windows of time and they sought to erase their trespass by killing off their product, creating cataclysms to destroy humanity. The other group was led by Enki, who was marooned on Earth to live among the humans that he sought to save. An interesting theory? No. These facts will be proven many times over with verifiable source materials as these videos progress. It was during the contact period, 3439 to 2647 BC, all before the flood, when both groups of Anunnaki abandoned the practice of using surrogate Anuna females, birth goddesses, and began extensive Anuna human interbreeding, but with totally different results. The Jewish author of the Genesis, Genesis text in Babylonia read the archaic records of the Anuna and Igigi groups and, and modeled their antediluvian history into two prevailing lineages, the Sethites and the Canaanites. The Canaanite women were modeled from the Igigi, rebel Anuna not sanctioned to visit Earthside. These Canaanite women gave birth to the Nephilim races of Anuna human hybrid mutants, giants, monsters, demigod-like people, many uh, having six fingers and toes on their hands and feet and a double row of teeth. For actual skeletons found with these traits, see Giants on Ancient Earth, an in-depth study on the Nephilim. It is a book I wrote, but I also have four videos that you can look at and see actual specimens and, and, and hear the source materials where these things can be found and seen. Who, who discovered them, or in some cases, when the Smithsonian destroyed the evidence. These were highly intelligent, morally deficient, and a very wicked group. Interestingly, red-haired giants, huge people found mummified with red hair still intact, double rows of teeth, and extra digits have been found all over North America, and some in Central America and South America. The Igigi descended races survived the Great Flood of 2239 BC at two prominent locations, North and South America, and the second being the Levant regions all connected together, Lebanon, Syria, Canaan, Israel, and Jordan area, and Sinai. After the Flood, the Sumerian name Igigi was recalled by the Pelasgian pre geek peoples as the sons of Gi, or Mother Earth, who bore the Gigantes, the giants. Prior to the deluge, the dark races all venerated goddesses, remembering the Anuna surrogate birth mothers. Patriarchal gods were introduced strictly by Caucasians, descended from the Inkite Anuna, condemned to remain on earth. The Achaeans of ancient Greece referred to the land of the giants as being in the far west. The, the, or, this is the origin of the term Tartarus. Over the ocean in a place called Ogygia, very close, very, where the Gigantes lived. The Igigi. The Igigi descended races of giants are listed in Genesis as the Rephaim, the Anakim, the Emums, the Zamzumums, and the Zumums. 
The biblical record names Homo sapien races closely kin or descended from these giants as being the Avums, the Horums, and the Amalekites. The latter led by a king named Agag from Gog or Igig, who is described in scriptures as much taller than King Saul. The very fact that the Bible mentions that someone was much taller than King Saul is very remarkable, for the biblical record clearly reads that King Saul was two heads taller than any other men of Israel. The Horums of Seir had intermarried with the Ammonites, Moabites, and Edomites, from whom were descended the Jewish people. As will be shown in many coming videos, the off-world contention between the Anunnaki and their Igigi kin of antiquity has continued unabated through their descendants through every epoch of world history all the way today between the media and, and the people of the world today. The progeny of Enki became of Enoch to the Jewish authors of Genesis in their Sethite genealogy to Noah who sanitized the clear references to racial distinctions that prevailed before the flood. In Genesis, the Hebrew word for ge generations is Toledo. It is about racial pedigree. The book of Genesis reads, these be the generations of Adam. This would be Adamu, refers to black eyed haired people with no beards, red brown skin, even the earliest Sumerians referring to themselves proudly as the black headed people. Genesis says, these be the generations of Cain, and we know Cain, a people of the ancient Americas, created after the Adamu. The oldest American traditions all refer to the race of Cain. These be the generations of Seth. Now, of Set, a reference to pre-flood Egyptian civilization. These be the generations of Noah, descendant of Enoch, Enki. All the extra-canonical and Dead Sea Scrolls texts describe the birth of Noah as the first time the pre-flood world ever saw the birth of a white-skinned, blue-eyed homo sapien. But, but we've already discussed this, and we may, we may return to it as uh, this research progresses. These be the generations of Shem. This would be Shimsu Hor, the children of the sun, a Caucasian pre-flood race who inherited the sciences and knowledges of the Anuna of their parentage, who were the founders of the great post-technolithic post cities and global heliolithic maritime empire of the builders after the flood. Genesis also reads, these be the generations of Abraham. Now we know Abraham as Brahma, the Aryan patriarch of ancient Vedic Caucasians, whose consort was Sarah Swati, just as Abram's consort was Sarah, later changing her name to Sarai. You must know this history. You have no excuse not to know it because my videos are free. Only by coming to term, terms with what occurred in antiquity, who altered these histories into what we have been taught, and why they sought to cover them up, would you gain great insight into our modern media fixation on race relations. The strife between the two opposing groups of Anunnaki, Homo Anuna and the Igigi, per persists today and has completely saturated every aspect of our present life. I'll conclude with a quote from my favorite cynic who wrote this sometime between 1919 and 1940. Beings from other places have come to this earth. Some of them more degrade some of the more degraded ones have fell felt at home here and have hung around or have stayed here, concealing their origin, of course, having perhaps only a slightly foreign appearance. That quote was from Charles Fort a hundred years ago. Having concluded this video study, let's now look a little bit closer at the person of Enoch. It is generally believed that the documents that we call the Old Testament records, according to scholars, they didn't come into existence until about 300 BC, maybe not even that early. Now, the Christian world is convinced that the Old Testament is very old, it's ancient, the, the books of, are, are of high antiquity, but many of, the, many of the concepts and ideas and even whole passages from the Old Testament are definitely taken from older source materials, but the Old Testament itself, as a collection of books put together, is definitely not very old. In fact, it only antedates Christianity by about three centuries the New Testament records. However, there is a collection of writings that came to be called the Book of the Upright, a very, very old province, very, from 
the, the, the fragments of this book are of such antiquity that we find even word for word passages mirroring old clay and cuneiform and stone writings from 2,000 years earlier. It is very unique. It's also highly controversial, and scholars have done a great disservice in trying to uh, basically uh, try to disprove the antiquity of this book. It is called the Book of the Upright. Many of you know it as the Book of Jasher. Now, 2,000 years ago, the renowned Jewish historian Flavius Josephus had, uh, had pretty much written about the book of Jasher, saying that it was largely unknown even in his time and forgotten outside the temple in Jerusalem. This book is more extensive than any of the biblical writings is, and is itself mentioned by name in the biblical books of Joshua and 2 Samuel, both references reading, Is This Not Written in the Book of Jasher? Now, this is why many, many apologists, uh, they, they, they want to justify the Book of the Upright, the Book of Jasher, as being a part of the canon, because it's mentioned by the canon as a source material, and they may be right. I'm not here to argue that point. I only want to tell you what's in this very old book. Now, Josephus wrote that by this book are to be understood certain records kept in some place on purpose, giving an account of what happened among the Hebrews from year to year, and called Jasher, or upright. It would have originally been called Ashur. Now, on account of the fidelity of the annals, a copy of this book was found in rabbinical Hebrew, discovered in Jerusalem when the Roman general Titus, son of the emperor Vespasian, destroyed the city and looted the temple before destroying it as well. The book of Jasher is said to be one of the few manuscripts secreted out of the Alexandrian library in Egypt just prior to its ruin by the Islamic armies. In 800 AD, the book was rediscovered by the Anglo-Saxon scholar Albinus Alcuin, who, who translated it from the Hebrew into Latin. Another copy survived the centuries of the burning times brought on by the Inquisition and was printed in Venice in the year 1613. A very damaging forgery of the Book of Jasher was published in the year 1751 in England. It was republished in Bristol in 1829, a poorly written work of 62 pages that makes Jasher to be one of the judges of the Old Testament. It has no connection whatsoever to the actual Book of the Upright that I'm citing here, which is a huge book. Had this plagiarist known that Jasher literally means upright and was a description of the text's historical integrity, he, he would have not have committed so blatant an error as to claim that Jasher was a pronoun, the name of a hitherto unknown man in biblical history. But the damage was done. To the 19th century critics and scholars, the forgery provided the, preju the prejudice that they needed to shun away any further research. Acad academia now pretty much regarded, regarded this as a false text. In the face of higher criticism, the real book of Jasher was fated to live on in obscurity, suppressed by those who would have greatly benefited the world by studying it. Though the Royal Asiatic, Asiatic Society in England discovered yet another copy of the Book of Jasher far away in Calcutta, this fascinating chronological record of the pre-flood world and ancient history thereafter is only now beginning in the 21st century to gain prominence amongst serious researchers. Though the forgeries of Jasher were many, there were some 19th century historians who recognized the importance of these records, writers who contributed to our understanding of the accomplishments of Enoch and the world he lived in. In 1875, the authors Hodder M. Westrop and C. Staniland Wake, two of my favorite authors, uh, uh, by the way, both referred to the Book of Jasher as a credible source of historical information in their own book, Ancient Symbol Worship, a work that extensively expounds upon the religions of antiquity. The translation of Jasher they cited in their research was by Dr. Donaldson, which was in its second edition. In 1883, the famous occultist Gerald Massey cited the Jasher writings in his huge work titled The, G the Natural Genesis, it's two volumes, it's over a thousand pages, it's gigantic, and it's very well worth the read. Because of the amazing facts and formerly forgotten information found within these two books, Ancient Symbol Worship and The Natural Genesis, as well as other works by Massey, these books will be cited over and over in future videos in our journey to understand Enoch and his times. 
The Alcuin translation in 800 AD, over 12 centuries ago, reads, And the soul of Enoch was wrapped up in the instruction of the Lord, in knowledge and in understanding, and he wisely retired from the sons of men, and secreted himself from them for many days. And all the kings of the sons of men, both first and last, together with their princes and judges, came to Enoch when they heard of his fame, and they bowed to him. And they also required of Enoch to reign all over them, to which he consented. And they assembled all 130 kings and princes, and they were all under his power and command. And Enoch taught them wisdom and knowledge in the ways of the Lord, and he made peace amongst them, and peace was throughout the earth during the reign of Enoch. And Enoch reigned over the sons of men 243 years, and he did righteousness and justice with all his people. The identity of Enoch as having ruled over 130 kings and rulers who established an empire that endured 243 years, a regent spiritually attuned to the Creator, who also left upon the earth an enduring testimony designed to last until the last generations, could not possibly have been forgotten. As we will see, there remains astonishing confirmation concerning this antediluvian king and the legacy he left behind, still standing silently upon the Giza Plateau. Another formerly lost book integral to our study from Al Alexandria is the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, a writing last edited by a Greek in Egypt during the early church period. Attributed to Enoch, this writing was lost for over 1,200 years and has only resurfaced from manuscripts from Russia and Serbia, a fact that has earned it the title of Slavonic Enoch. It was rediscovered in 1886 by Professor Solokov in the archives of the Belgrade Public Library, having remarkably survived the church burnings. The popularity of Secrets of Enoch was largely due to the renewal of interest in Enochian writings after the publication of Richard Lawrence's translation of the Book of Enoch in the year 1821. Forty-eight years after the Scottish explorer James Bruce discovered copies of this formerly lost Book of Enoch in the country of Ethiopia in the year 1773. In this writing, Adam was commanded by God to preserve the sacred books and writings of Adam and Seth. The text in the Book of the Secrets of Enoch reads that he was to protect these ancient pre-flood writings lest they perish not in the deluge which I shall bring upon the, the, thy race. These books contained many of the secrets of God and the creation learned by early man, and it was Enoch's duty to ensure that these writings and mysteries would not be lost in the cataclysm known as the Great Flood. These divine instructions were given to Enoch, who passed them down to his sons at the death of Adam, the 243rd and final year of the prophet king's reign. Two old manuscripts, both having survived millennia at separate locations, mention this 243-year reign of Enoch. It was at that exact time, according to the book of Jasher, that the prophet learned that he was to ascend into heaven and not return. The text reads, Enoch assembled all the inhabitants of the earth and taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instructions. And he said unto them, I have been required to ascend unto heaven. I therefore do not know the day of my going. We gather that the divine instructions that he gave his people, the Sethites, before the flood, concern the preservation of knowledge imparted by the Godhead to humanity from the days of Adam, King Enos, the priest Jared, Enoch's father, and Seth. To char the charge given to Enoch by Adam concerned records of great importance. It would make little sense to go through heroic efforts to save mere books which could be easily protected from the elements by those surviving the deluge. This must have been a truly colossal collection of knowledge. As we will find herein, these divine instructions concerned a massive construction project designed to preserve the writings of the old world in such a way that humanity would gain access to them once again at a future date long after their own world was gone. Such a method of preservation would require a monument sufficiently large enough to survive the waters of the flood. In the sight of all men, Enoch ascended into heaven on a cloud, and according to the secrets of Enoch text, the Sethite descendants immediately went to work. Methuselah, the son of Enoch, and his brethren, all the sons of Enoch, made and erected an altar at the place called Akuzan, whence and where Enoch had been taken into heaven. 
This was the altar of God promised to Adam, and it was built at the middle of the earth where the Sethites were to bury their forefather Adam, the same location Enoch vanished from. As found in the book of Enoch sometime in his prophetic career, he had a vision of the Great Pyramid and its relation to the Tree of Life. He called it a mountain of fire at the middle of the earth, a description that we shall learn that was employed by the ancients when referring to the monument. Enoch describes its stones as brilliant and beautiful, splendid to behold. An angel tells Enoch, That mountain thou beholdest, the extent of whose head resembled the seat of the Lord, will be the seat on which shall sit the holy and great Lord of glory. Now we know this person is the chief cornerstone, the everlasting king, according to the book of Enoch, when he shall come and descend to visit the earth with goodness. We have already shown that Enoch and Enki are the same person, that the great cataclysm that occurred when the Anunnaki first appeared, Enki among them, was centrally located at in Egypt. Ancient Egypt is the Gihon River, the Nile. So we should not be so surprised to find that an Arabian scholar recording a, a tradition that was over a thousand years old and recorded a thousand years ago, when he right before he died in 967 AD, the Arab scholar Masaudi wrote this about this most amazing king who lived a long time ago. Surid, one of the kings of Egypt before the flood, built the two great pyramids. That the reason for building the pyramids was the following dream, which happened to Surid 300 years previous to the flood. It appeared to him that the earth was overthrown, that the inhabitants were laid prostrate upon it, that the fixed stars wandered confusedly from their courses and clashed together with a tremendous noise. In another vision, he saw the fixed stars des descend upon the earth in the form of white birds and seizing the people, enclosed them in a cleft between two mountains which shut upon them. Early in the morning, he assembled the priests from all the gnomes of Egypt, all 130 in number. No other persons were admitted to this assembly. When he related his first and second vision, the interpretation was declared to announce that some great event was about to take place. Did you catch that? Built the two great pyramids, and he was a ruler over 130 gnomes or, or provinces. The exact same thing the book of Jasher said about Enoch. Even Zechariah Sitchin in his Earth Chronicles series shows that the Anunnaki assembled and had a great meeting of minds when, when they were trying to determine what they were going to do with the information about the great flood that was coming. So, again, we should not be surprised that a very ancient tradition about Surid reads, this again, quoting Masaudi, that that Surid ordered the pyramids to be built, and the predictions of the priests to be inscribed upon the columns, and upon the large stones belonging to them. And he placed within him his treasures, and all his valuable property, together with the bodies of his ancestors. He also ordered the priests to deposit within them written accounts of their wisdom and achievements in the different arts and sciences, the writings of their forefathers, likewise the position of the stars and their circles, together with the history and chronicles of times past, and that which is to come, and to every future event. If you're interested in pursuing this vein of research, my own book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza, covers all of this and hundreds of other facts that I have not put in any videos about the linking of Enoch and Enki and the Great Pyramid Complex being built before the flood. That is a, that is a subject that was my passion about 10 years ago, and I've pretty, pretty much fully exhausted any ability to, to carry that any further. However, it was mentioned here to show context, to show that when Enoch was reigning on earth, there was great peace for those 243 years, but as soon as he disappeared, something occurred that shattered that peace. It wasn't just merely his departure, but something it entered the historical record for which we have many copies of, and I have already shown in prior videos, that, that shows that when Enoch left, a whole new governing body appeared. It's called the Sumerian king list, and I've already showed it to you, because when Enoch left, there was 670 years left before the flood, the entire duration of the seven kings of the Anunnaki, the 241,200 shars, which is exactly 670 years on the draconian calendar of 360 days a year. 
An adept historian is an investigator. We build pictures from the pieces of the past. This, these charts in this video are, will be an example. Two different ancient American calendars, the Vedic and the Sumerian calendars, as well as a popular Egyptian Old Kingdom date calendars, are learned from records and texts spread across three continents. However, they all synchronize in a 21-year period within a framework of over 5,000 years. These timekeeping systems involved ages and factons in larger cycles. It's like cycles and epicycles. But they counted time in measures of days. The Maya Itza Temple of the cross calendar concerns a raging goddess and the return of her power. The Maya calendar concerns ancient demons once on earth returning in 13th Bactan. The Kali Yuga of India calendar involved an evil goddess of, of apocalyptic destruction and the return of her destructive power to earth. The Sumerian Etana record concerned a patriarchal figure like Enoch Enki uh, who opposed the establishment. In the rabbinical Hag Haggadoth, the Genesis pre-flood chronology and Book of Jasher, we find Enoch alive during this period, himself described as a keeper of the times. He prophesied against the Watchers or the Nephilim. Many scholars date the Vedic calendar to have actually begun 3103 BC or 864 years before the Great Flood in 2239 BC. Many would attribute, attribute the synthesis of, of these uh, begin dates of calendar systems 864 years before the cataclysm to be coincidence, but I see something different, a greater architecture of events is at work. 864 is a golden mean number of the Fibonacci series, the foundation of mechanical time. A day is 86,400 seconds, 60 days is 86,400 minutes, 360 days is 8,640 8, hours. 24 years is 8,640 days. 72 years, which is a processional degree, is 864 months. 8 Bactans and Vedic Yugas is 864,000 days. The 12 144 base denominator commonality between these variant systems exhibits evidence of a common origin initially. But upon deeper scrutiny of, the, of these calendrical mysteries, especially when we align the 138-year timeline of the Phoenix with these dates, a synthesis emerges that defies rational ex explanation. History is a mathematical construct. Check out this video. What we are looking at here in this chart is a synthesis of ancient calendrical systems that that beyond coincidence could never have begun at the exact same time if they were not originally the same calendrical system. At, at the top of the chart, you will see that 3121 BC began the Maya Itza Temple of the Cross calendar. It was a day count system calendar, just like all the old, uh, calendars of the old world. Uh, now, 3113, of course, is the Mayan long count calendar. It began 13 Bactans. These 13 units of time to the ancient Maya were 144,000 days apiece. Now, uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding about it. I, my book, Anunnaki Homeworld, was published in 2011. I know I've said this in many videos, and I showed where 2012 was not the end of the Mayan long count. Of course, I was ignored. Well, we'll do, we'll do videos on the Mayan long count in this series in the future because it's relevant to Anunnaki history and the apocalyptic time period that's coming upon us after May 2040. Now, in 3102 BC, we have the Brahmanic Kali Yuga age begun. It also is a calendar based off day count systems and uh, units of 144. It's crazy. Now, 3100 BC is, or, is about the time scholars estimate the Sumerian Etana reign, which is a Sumerian version of Enoch. Also, 3100 BC, we have the Egyptian Narmer beginning his reign. You guys pretty much know him by Scorpion King. Now these five ancient calendrical systems are very interesting because they align here at 3100 BC, which was the 108th year of the reign of Enoch. Enoch ruled 300 years. Now, 243 years of his rule, according to the book of Joshua, was very peaceful. However, this was the 108th year. Enoch was the architect of the Great Pyramid. The 300 years he reigned, reigned under the Draconian system was 300 times 360 days, which is 108,000 days. 
for of further significance, he passed the divine instructions on how to build the Giza complex at Akuzan at the same place he vanished. And the Sethites, you know of Meshimsu Hor in, in ancient original Egypt, built this monument and they finished it in the year 2815 BC, which was 666 years before the Great Flood, which was caused by Phoenix. Now, 2815 BC completion of the Giza complex and Great Pyramid was the year 1080 Annus Mundi, 1080 of the, of the ancient pre-flood world, 108 times 10. The monument they built, a pyramid, is actually in geometry, this pyramidion is a five-pointed uh, uh, figure, and when laid out two-dimensionally, it becomes a pentagram. And all pentagram, anybody who's familiar with the principles of geometry will know that every single pentagram, when you lay it out, uh, lay it out on a piece of paper, you get ten angles that are all 108 degrees apart. It's very interesting. Now, this chart represents a very definitive time in biblical history called the pre-flood world, the antediluvian world. It was 1656 years, which was in Phoenix orbits. It also began with the Phoenix reset, a new heavens, a new earth, a great lithospheric displacement pole shift that ended a 930-year so, uh, year old civilization. Uh, they're called the Jinn. They're called the Preadamites. Anthropologists call them the Cro-Magnon. That was 3895 B.C. Their civilization was totally destroyed, and the pre-flood world began. Now, this 1656 years also ended in a Phoenix reset with the Great Flood, and we've done many videos on that. We're not going to beat that up any further. Now, if you look at the bottom of the chart, you will see two 600-year periods. These are the Anunnaki Nur calendar periods, and we're going to do a video on the Anunnaki Nur in this because you need to know about the Anunnaki, how they reckon time, and what this actually means. These were 216,000 days each under the Draconian system, 600 years. The very beginning of this Nur period on this on this uh, chart shows 3439 BC. The Watchers descended, and when they descended. One third of mankind was killed in a cataclysm. We've already discussed that in another video, as mentioned in the Haggadah text and in the, in the, in the Book of Jasher and the Sumerian records about the arrival of Enoch. Not the beginning of, the beginning of his reign, his arrival. Now, it began a 600 year period till the birth of a very prominent individual, Noah of the, of the, of the uh, city of Shurapak. Now, 600 years again from the birth of Noah, we have the Great Flood. This is biblical dating. This isn't me. But these 1,200 years make up 432,000 days, or 144,000 times 3. Only by reckoning the ancient calendrical systems from the old world and as day count systems do they make any sense. But when we do so, every date moniker in the Sumerian records and later Akkadian and Babylonian that were cited by Zechariah Sitchin fits within perfectly within a 2,000 year period. And we're going to show that in, in, in videos. We're going to show definitive proof that every date in the old Near Eastern texts were not 35,000 years, 432, 241,200 days, uh, years. It wasn't. They were days. They were turnings. Because in ancient times, they did not care about the sun or the moon. What they cared about was how many times the stars turned around the eye of the dragon. This is why, this is exactly why all these calendar systems are, their chief denominators are in 12 and in 144. They are base denominators that were, that were counted in days in order to, in order to, uh, uh, factor in regnal lists, to factor in a life and birth list, to factor in important events that happened in ancient history. Once we recalibrate our thinking that all these ancient dates were in days, you're going to understand everything about the dating of Atlantis, what, what the Egyptians meant by 35,400 days, a certain pharaoh did this and all that. It all makes perfect sense, and it abbreviates the human timeline to a 5,500-year period when we first received civilization from somewhere else. These five ancient calendrical systems from the Old World, the Maya Itza Temple of the Cross, the Mayan Long Count, the Brahmanic Kali Yuga, the Sumerian Itana Ita Ita Reigns, the Egyptian Narmer Palate, and the Scorpion King. These five different dated in, uh, events and calendars all fit within a 21-year period. 21-year disparity in the start dates in context from 51 centuries to the present and their 12144 base denominators proves that these time systems and events were all 
talking about, they're all recording the exact same event. And it, it all came to pass. Their inception was during the reign of Enoch. Now, in this chart, we have some uncanny parallels as well, but they only denote the veracity of what I'm telling you. They're showing you that these parallels show common origins in these uh, these, these uh, timekeeping systems. So, the second group is about the flood itself. Look at the bottom of the chart, and you will see Hebraic genealogy of the antediluvian patriarchs in Genesis is 1656 years to the Great Flood. And as you know, this is tucked in between 3895 B.C. and, and uh, 2239 B.C., being two Phoenix cataclysms. Now, the Sumerian king list record about Etana also holds that he ruled 1560 years before the Great Flood. And you can see how that's only 96 years short of the biblical dating. Now, the Egyptian priest historian Manatho wrote that Thoth, which many be believe was a type of Enoch, ruled for 1570 years. Here we are, 86 years short of the biblical dating. The ancient Chinese date derived from the Shu King text of their version of the Great Flood was in 2254 BC, which is here 15 years short of the biblical dating. The pre Aztec Toltec water sun age ended after 1716 years, which was 2179 BC. Now, this is 60 years over, but it's very easy. And I, I explain in my published books on in Anunnaki Homeworld and in Return of the Fallen Ones that the reason why the Aztecs were off by 60 years is because they did not factor in the 33.3. Uh, uh, time periods in their traditions to a 50-year period. In ancient America, 52 was the number that all calendars were based upon, and they do, and they all they did was all all they did was take the 33 jubilees and multiply it by 52 instead of 50, and they got 60 years off from the original dating, which is perfectly understanding understandable because we're talking about chronographers and historians using borrowed materials from millennia. Uh, prior to when they lived and rewriting their chronologies to fit into the best way they knew how. They did a fantastic job in the context of 50, in the context of over 4,500 years since the Great Flood, 60 years off is acceptable. Also on this chart, you can see here at 2815 BC, the Giza complex is complete. Now, the Giza complex being complete was only, was just a few years after the birth of Noah himself in 2839 BC. Now, here are other historical synchronicities that are beyond coincidence that denote that they're recording the same event. Now, we know the 670-year Sumerian king list, as we have decoded in earlier, earlier videos, and we will return to, be, began 2909 B.C. Now, at 2843 B.C., the Egypto-Coptic date of the Giza construction, we have Coptic records concerning the building of the Great Pyramids, and those Coptic records provide many date, date uh, chrono markers, and when you add them up, when you arrive at the date of 2843 B.C. for the completion of the Giza monuments, very interesting. These are published in my, in my book, uh, uh, Return of the Fallen Ones. Now, also, in 2839 B.C., we have the 600-year kingship begins, the Anunnaki Seven Kings. Now, that's, that's the subject. The 600-year Anunnaki Nur, their regnal, their regnal period was 600 years, but the 670 was because the first 70 years was definitely a matriarchal figure, and we'll get to, we'll get to that later. Now, 2839 B.C. was 600 years life of Noah to the Great Flood. Now, the biblical narratives coincide with these historical texts, which is which is very interesting. Enoch is already gone. He's passed he's passed off his divine instructions. He's missing from the picture. Enoch is not here. Enoch Enki Enoch, he's not even in the picture when the Great Pyramid is being built. He is merely the one that passed those those uh those timelines on. Now in this next chart you see the Toltec water sun age ended after 17, 16 years, which is 52 times 33. Exactly what you told you a minute ago. Now, another, the Dutch Oralind text tells of the flood cataclysm in great detail and dates it at 2184 BC, which is only 55 years off. Again, 4,500 years of history, 55 years is a bullseye. The Roman historian Marcus Varro also dated the Great Pyramid. 
my apologies, not the Great Pyramid, the Great Flood, at 2200 BC, which is 39 years off. The Macedonian historian Callisthenes dates the flood in Babylon at 2233 BC, which is only six years difference. There are many chronologists throughout history who have dated the pre-flood world as being 1656 years, copying the biblical record, but they don't actually produce the, the, the dates when that happened. There are some who have, and they got it wrong because they tried to copy early Jewish history before there were, I mean, after the rabbinical corruptions were introduced. One of those, one of those chronologists is Archbishop James Usher. But in modern times, using the chronological statements in the book of Jasher and in the Genesis text and the Assyrian eponyms, the modern author Stephen Jones wrote a book called Secrets of Time. And in his index in the chronology in the back, he dates the flood at exactly 2239 B.C. And he dates the beginning of the modern world's calendar, the Annas Mundi calendar, at 3895 B.C. This is totally independent of the Phoenix research. In fact, I had not even developed my Phoenix chronology, which also says the exact same thing until years after Secrets of Time was published. While this sums up this video, we are not done with this study because in the next video, we are going to show that the ancient Chinese Dragon Kings and the Sumerian King List are the exact same record. They date the flood. They date, they date the, the individual regnal kings of the dragon kings, who the dragon kings were. And every bit of this is Anunnaki history. It is relevant to the Anuna files. And prepare to be shocked. This is some fascinating 4,800 year old history. Chinese historians date the founding of the dynasty of the dragon kings at the year 2852 BC. This was the first dynasty of China known as the Five Monarchs, in which there are actually nine rulers, a dynasty enduring 646 years to the year 2206 BC when it ended in a flood. This is 24 years variance from the Sumerian king list, which shows the Anunnaki dynasty of seven kings, other versions ten kings, began 670 years before the Great Flood in 2239 BC. This demonstrates that the Chinese tradition is the same as the Sumerian version. Chinese dragons, strangely, are bearded. The beard was the chief trait of foreigners who ruled over them. The dragons were ancient rulers, and later in Chinese history, it was the rulers of their own people that were linked to these ancient strangers who brought them civilization. The Chinese emperor was believed to have dragon blood. Emperor Yao was called dragon-faced, which was not a description of a reptilian visage, but of a human face with a beard. Chinese traditions link the dragon with the development of man and his instructions in the arts and art, art, uh, agriculture. The Chinese story of bearded Anunnaki, Anunnaki people bringing civilization is the same as the Sumerian version. There are no differences. The early Sumerian was was a uh, pictographic, just like the early Chinese and Egyptian uh, scripts. Many books and reports have been published demonstrating the uncanny similarities between the pictographs of all three peoples. Now, in 2909 BC, a Nuna kingship began 670 years before the flood, which was 241,200 shars or days turnings of the stars around all Alpha Draconis to the year of the flood 2239 BC. The Anunnaki dynasty began at Eridu with two kings lasting 180 years to 2729 BC. Eridu is the Irad of Genesis text. Sumerian kinglist reads that kingship was first lowered from heaven to the city of Eridu. This place in Genesis called Irad, from the root meaning to descend, is also found in the biblical name of Jared, Enoch's father. A completely made up Jewish invention. The original text concerned the descent of Enki, but the Jewish scribes in Babylon rendered it Enoch descended from Jared. Over 120 years ago, Ignatius Donnelly wrote, The early history of China indicates contact with an advanced race. Fuhi, regarded as a demigod, founded the Chinese Empire in 2852 BC. He introduced cattle and taught the arts of writing. 
Some Sinologists believe that the Chinese culture originated in Mesopotamia. In the Middle East, the Sumerian language stands alone for it is agglutinative, in this respect belonging to the same group as the Chinese. Even today, the Chinese syllabary is based on signs fundamentally similar to the old Sumerian pictographs. In structure, Proto-Sumerian resembles Chinese and Turkish, but in vocabulary, it resembles no known languages, living or dead. In 2729 BC, the Anunnaki abandoned Eridu, Biblical Irad, moving kingship to Badtabira. This dynasty of three kings would last 300 years. Now, if you remember, we saw that Enochian dynasty lasted 300 years as well. This is 108,000 days to the year 2349 BC. In 2357 BC, Tiku's son Yao ascends the throne of China, thus beginning the historical period. In 2349 BC, the Anuna moved kingship from Larak to Sippar, a dynasty of one king lasting 58.33 years, 21,000 days on a 360-day calendar, to 2290 BC. In 2309 BC, Wilkins in Mysteries of Ancient South America wrote concerning this year, it is disturbing coincidence that ancient myths stress that the catastrophes, the coming flood of thousands of years ago, were preceded by gigantic wars and that men wandered forth warning of the wrath to come, of which these wars were but premonitions. In 2290 BC, Anuna moved their kingship from Sippar to Shurapak a dynasty of one king lasting 51.66 years, or 18,600 days, to the Great Flood itself in 2239 B.C. Shurapak is mentioned in many Near Eastern texts as being one of the last great metropolis cities before the Flood. In 2297 B.C., this is a variant dating for the Chinese Flood of Yao. It is 58 years off from 2239 B.C. 2239 BC, the flood occurred, a phoenix reset, in the reign of Yao of China. This would have been the 118th year of Yao. Not unreasonable in the Chinese chronology that the, that, that has Shen Luang reigning 164 years and Fuhi reigning 140 years. But what's really interesting is that the Chinese recorded that it was the 118th year of the reign of a very popular emperor, Yao. Remember, the flood traditions in the Near East were all attached to a 120-year warning period. Now, Chinese flood tradition actually reads, The pillars of heaven were broken, the earth shook to its very foundations, the heavens sunk lower toward the north, the sun, the moon, and the stars changed their motions, the earth fell to pieces, and the waters enclosed within its bosom burst forth with violence. The sun was darkened. The planets altered their course. Ancient Chinese legends recount a great flood in which eight people, the same number as mentioned in Genesis with Noah and his family, survived the flood on a, on a vessel. In 2239 BC, the great flood, we have this reference here from a, from a Jesuit mission, missioner, 17th century, a very rare Latin volume titled History of China. This is like 300 years ago, wrote that before the great catastrophe occurred, four seasons succeeded, succeeded each other regularly and without confusion. There were no excessive rains. The sun and moon, without ever being clouded, furnished a light purer and brighter than today. The five planets kept on their course without any inequality. Nothing harmed man, nor did he harm anything. Then the second heaven. Now Wilkins equates the second son of the, the the second son of the American traditions to the second heaven or the second mandate of heaven of the ancient Chinese. The pillars of heaven were suddenly broken, the earth shook to its foundations, the sky sank lower towards the north, the sun and the moon and stars changed their motions. All of these from ancient Chinese texts describing this this terrible cataclysm. When the earth fell to pieces and the waters in its bosom uprushed with violence and overflowed when the sun darkened. Now, the final 646 years of the Chinese Dragon King chronology is unmistakably aligned with the 670 years of the Sumerian Anunnaki King list to the Flood. Both of these chronologies end with the Flood Cataclysm. Both of them concern bearded Anuna and Dragon Kings, bearded rulers over a non-bearded, uh, a smooth-skinned race of people. Now, 
The Sumerians were in the lower Tigris and the Chinese were in the Yellow River Yangtze, but the most ancient Chinese and Oriental traditions all concern the Ainu and the ancient Nordic Aryans that had existed in those countries in a, pre, in a pretty much in a primordial time, a prehistorical period, a, a history that unfolded in a preliterate period. This is all very intriguing, and it's absolute evidence that the Chinese and the Sumerians actually came from the same region, and they just transferred their traditions with them in their migrations. In some of my Anuna videos here, you have seen a chart that shows the, the early pictographs of China and Sumer being almost identical when, 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 the, when the language, not when the language, but when the scripts were being initially developed. And while the Sumerians prided themselves as being the black-headed people, they were no different than the ancient Chinese, also a black-headed people of smooth skin, unable to grow facial hair. In a coming video, we will see that this phenomenon is not isolated. We're not isolating the particulars of the past. We're going to show how the same traditions also developed or actually carried into or remembered by Melanesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, the South Pacific on isolated islands in the middle of the Pacific, thousands of miles away from any continental coastlines, and yet those people so isolated still remember the exact same histories of the Dragon Kings or the Anunnaki or the bearded, white-skinned, gemstone-eyed people that came and brought them civilization. This is Jason again, Archaics.com. Welcome to part 16 of the Anuna Files. We have three Anuna Files videos being released today. Uh, a fourth video is being released as well, but it's not a part of the Anuna Files. Now, for those of you who have been waiting on the charts, our first charts packet is going to be released very soon. Uh, the announcement will, will be made right here in the next day or so on uh, our YouTube channel. And... Uh, a way for you to order the books, too. Many of you have been asking about the books. There are five, six, seven books. It depends on what you're interested in. But we have several books you can order straight through uh, the uh, Facebook page or archaics.com. Uh, the means by which to do so will be announced right here. It will be in the comment section on uh, the, one of the next videos. It's uh, going to make it very easy for you and as cheap as possible to get these books on the Phoenix chronology, on the Nibiru chron chronology, on the Anunnaki Anuna chronology, which is totally different, the Anunnaki Nerve System, on uh, ancient goddess calendars. Uh, we have charts coming on all that material, things you can put up in your wall, pen and ink illustrated charts that will be signed personally by me. Uh, I am the one drawing these charts. Uh, you've seen hundreds of my charts already, but they're they're typing paper sized charts that were drawn and illustrated. These are much larger. Uh, you can frame these. Uh, let's see. As far as news, we don't have any more. I just hope, enjoy this presentation. Uh, we have already released one, two, maybe three videos on the goddess in a, in ancient times. The old matriarchal. Uh, civilizations that the patriarchal Anuna had come, come in contact with had basically interrupted. Uh, this is uh, this video is about the Anuna, but it's also mentioning the goddess again, because prior to the arrival of the Anunnaki, all, all the civilizations were matriarchal. All of them were goddess venerating. Uh, enjoy this presentation. Like I said, three Anuna Files videos will be released today. The accounts of Anuna origin seem confusing, out of the sea or out of the sky. But the most popularized account is not original, but an anachronistic misunderstanding of older records. Originally, the oldest writing, Sumerian, depicted the Anuna as having dropped from heaven. They were not amphibian. Nephilim is Hebrew for the fallen ones or those who drop down. That this refers to fallen angels is purely religious invention. After the Great Flood Cataclysm, the Sumerian texts were translated into Akkadian and Babylonian. These translators found multitudes of references to Anuna having, having appeared on Earth from the deep. This deep, Abzu, was originally an astronomical designation for the largely unknown abyss of the southern hemispheric space. The region of space below our solar system that cannot be viewed from the northern hemisphere. You must realize... 
almost every civilization in antiquity was north of the equator. They could not see the stars of the southern hemisphere. These were the abyssal stars. In Babylon, artists showed gods emerging from the sea, a terrestrial abyss, and soon after, reliefs gave such marine deities amphibious characteristics. Later scribes compounded the association until the gods almost a thousand years after the great flood of 2239 BC were represented as part fish. Even later in time, they would be represented with wings to symbolize their origin from the sky and ability to fly, and the concept of angels was born. Further compounding this is the fact that the, the earliest Sumerian records depict them as coming from the sea, but on ships. Not spaceships, but wooden ships. There were bearded foreigners that had appeared among them. Now, as time progressed, maybe the foreigners themselves. It's very possible the Anuna wanted them to believe they had come from the stars. And, and, and the association was born. But they had actually come from a post-cataclysm, maybe war-torn continent that they had escaped from. And appeared new among very primitive people. The early Sumer Sumerians, the black-headed people. Excavated tablets from the Sumerian city of Nippur tell of the arrival of the Anuna to a mountainous region. They set up a camp in a fertile valley and called their settlement Eden. These are the Karsag tablets, and Eden is a name implying a walled enclosure. An Anuna female called the Serpent Lady was among them, known as Ninkarsag. In Egyptian, the hieroglyph and word for goddess also means serpent. The explanation we get in Genesis that Eve means the mother of all living is a borrowing from the older goddess religion of antediluvian antiquity. The mother goddess was the center of all pre-flood religious observances. From this anciently popular Sumerian account, the Jews borrowing heavily from the Babylonian libraries invented the Adam, Eve, Garden of Eden, and serpent themes that found their way into the composition of Genesis. From Eden, groups of Anuna spread out to become the ruling elite over indigenous humans who were living as beasts without culture, written language, or any type of infrastructure. These Anuna founded the dragon and serpent dynasties so popular in traditions about the pre-flood world. That the ancients provide no clear data on Nibiru suggests that the knowledge of this object was already obscure by the advent of writing systems. The oldest known writings in the world do not antedate 2200 BC. We have traditions claiming things were written down prior to this time, and there are references in the oldest text that there were copies of yet more ancient documents, but we simply have no examples. Even the most sophisticated technolithic architecture found in ancient Egypt is absolutely bereft of any hieroglyphics, pictographic text, or writing of any kind. 3439 BC begins the 792 years of, of the Anuna residence among humans on earth before the flood to the year 2647 BC when Nibiru passed through the inner solar system one last time prior to the great flood. Or perhaps it wasn't Nibiru as we'll see, it may be something else. Robert Temple had no date for this time, but we'll borrow his terminology this being the Anunnaki contact period. William Brambley called them the custodial society in his monumental work, The Gods of Eden. Now, Nibiru is the planet of the crossing, according to Zechariah Sitchin. Nibiru is one of the 50 divine names mentioned in the Babylonian Enuma Elish, the 49th name. The Babylonian Enuma Elish text reads, Nibiru shall hold the crossing of heaven and earth. Let crossing be his name. Robert Temple remarks that in the Enema Elish text, Nibiru is described not as a planet, but as a star. Sitchin wrote that Nibiru orbited its own star, not soul, but a star located in the deep. It, it appeared in the soul system seeking a new destiny, an orbit. When it appeared in the soul system, it had the longest circuit orbit of all of soul's planets. Nibiru approached planet Tiamat and destroyed her, capturing some of her 11 moons. Kingu, which we know of as Luna, our own moon, was among them. Nibiru continued on, finding a destiny, which was an orbit, and returned to the deep. Nibiru returned later to plunge through the debris of Tiamat, and over time her remnants filled her former orbit as the asteroid belt. 
Sitchin noticed that the Sumerian records referred to Nibiru as the planet of the crossing that the other known planets were told not to cross above nor below, referring to the ecliptic plane on which all other known planets orbit. Now, according to the author of Ancient Alien Question, Nibiru's existence as a planet is very questionable. No Sumerian text called Nibiru a planet, but Nibiru is mentioned in post-Sumerian cuneiform texts. References to, no, no, references to Nibiru found in scientific translations 120 years ago in the year 1900 in uh, the Reports of the Magicians and Astrologers of Nineveh and Babylon located in the British Museum today by Reginald Campbell, we read, When a halo surrounds the moon and Nibiru stands within it, there will be a slaughter of cattle and beasts of the field. Now, also, a planetary object called Marduk at its appearance is called Umpaduda, but after it has arisen for three hours or so, it is then called Sagmagar, but once it reaches the meridian of the sky, this same object is then called Nibiru. This is in the Reports of the Magicians and Astrologers, page, page 52. Now, in 1900, in the translations of Thomas Campbell of the Old Akkadian and Babylonian text, the scholars of the day arbitrarily inserted the word Jupiter in their translations, admitting that Jupiter was known by other names. But in their explanatory notes, they concede that the actual 3,000-year-old texts read Nibiru and Sagmagar, which was also Nibiru according to the ancient and modern translator. Now, here is the text with Nibiru where it belongs instead of the interpolated and deceitful Jupiter reference. The text reads, when Nibiru grows bright, the king of Akkad will go into preeminence. When Nibiru, now, when Nibiru grow, go, uh, grows bright, there will be foods and rains. When Nibiru culminates, the gods will give peace. Troubles will be cleared up and complications will be unraveled. Rains and foods will come. The amount of crops with regard to the cold will be out of all proportions to the amount of cold on the crops. The lands will dwell securely. Hostile kings will be at peace. From Nergal Ittar. This is clearly a prophecy of a future time of peace and prosperity caused by the appearance of Nibiru. Nor is this the only reference to the appearance of Nibiru bringing plenty and peace. Scholars debated over the identity of this Nibiru object long before the birth of Zechariah Sitchin who popularized it. So I just want to put the rumors to rest that Zechariah Sitchin did not invent Nibiru. It was already the subject of controversy in 1896 through 1901 when these Oxford and British Museum scholars were debating these issues. While Nibiru was a planet, Nemesis was not. Nibiru of the Anunnaki is more probable, probably a dark red dwarf binary companion to Sol within a Nuna populated world, moon, or super construction that uses it as a fairy. It must also be noted that even a super giant planet the size of Jupiter, if near Pluto, would still be invisible to the Earth. It's too far away. I'm often asked questions as to, as to, look, if Phoenix exists or if Nibiru exists, then how come we can't see it? I said, well, you can't see it for the same reason you can't see Uranus and Neptune either. It must, see, you, you have to under, people have to understand these objects are way too far away. Neptune is gigantic and Uranus is even closer and of the, relatively the same size. But, these gigantic worlds are invisible without telescopes. We can't see them today, and yet they're in our own solar system. And they're pretty close to Earth compared to the elongated orbits of both Phoenix and, and Nibiru or Nemesis. Now, Nibiru will not be visible from Earth until 2043 to 2045 before its arrival in November of 2046, but by this time it won't matter. The Phoenix phenomenon will have already occurred and totally changed the contours of our world. Coastlines, mountain ranges, drying ocean beds, replacing many regions that were thickly populated just hours prior to May 16th, 2040, when, when it occurs. Now, evidence for the existence of the, of the Nibiru brown dwarf, uh, excuse me, brown dwarf star derives from an unexpected source. 
Scientist Paul LaViolette, Ph.D., shows that the historic spacing of cosmic ray peaks in the geological record shows that it occurred 14 times in the last 6,000 years. Gamma ray bursts have bathed the Earth. The first saturation is approximately dated at 3300 B.C. The radio telescope findings are close to Nibiru's 3439 B.C. passage date. As an approximate, they are, ac they are exact. As the small brown dwarf star is within its perihelion period to Sol, it would occasionally release energy in the form of flares spewing cosmic radio par radioactive particles. Though La Violette does not mention Nibiru, the dating of the gamma ray bursts are too coincidental to ignore. These findings show that something saturates Earth with a cloud of ionized gas. I venture that this object bursts with with gamma ray activity upon close approach to perihelion. La Violette documenting a period coinciding with the Nibiru visitation from 1123 to 1063 BC, again in 522 common era to the year 1314. Now you have to understand in a coming video we're going to give the Nibiru orbit and we're going to show how these gamma ray bursts are absolutely perfect with it. Although it's chronological and, it, and it's dated by chrono, chronographical markers in ancient texts, these gamma ray bur, uh, bursts are very good evidence that the chronology is correct. Because the perihelion period is 60 years long before Nibiru exits the inner system till its return 732 years later, seven of the cosmic ray peaks can be attributed to Nibiru. That's astonishing. This, including the first, 3439 BC, and the last time it was in the inner system in the year 1314 Common Era. About 40% of the gamma ray burst occurred within a 500 years of one another in 650 to 1050 Common Era. Six rapid bursts back to back. And incidentally, it was that period of time that all the ancient American from Toltec, Zapotec, Ad, uh, 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 Mayan, uh, the Quiche, all these civilizations, Chaco Canyon, they all vanished. They disappeared. We don't know what happened to those people. It's very, very intriguing. These were not proximity saturations, but immense wave fronts from detonations or X-flare activity that came from Nemesis or Nibiru, whatever you want to call it. Not our own sun. La Violet's research accounts for 13 of the 14 radiation pulses. In the late 1960s, Dr. Anthony Hewish, 1974 Nobel Prize recipient in physics, working at Moulard Radio Astronomy Observatory, discovered in the southern sky, the abyss, remember it's called the abyss in ancient times, because they could not see it, unknown heavens, the radio emissions from an extinct star that had blown up or collapsed circa 4000 BC. That's amazing. This corresponds to our Phoenix New heavens and new earth, new simulation began 3895 BC when Phoenix, the Phoenix phenomenon totally re, totally initiated resets all over this known world and began this new calendar that we're existing within right now. That's fascinating. Totally independently at the same time, George Mikanowski, he deciphered an ancient Sumerian star catalog text concerning the same southern region of the heavens that told of a star explosion. In my published books and other posts and videos, it is my position that this nova or a binary colla uh, companion collapse is what so heavily damaged the planets and moons of our solar system. It is the origin of the phoenix, the dark satellite, and the Nib and Nibiru, the asteroid belt, and the comets. This was the collapse of Nemesis from our two-star system to a single-star system with a dark star. It was about 4,000 B.C., 4,039 to be precise, as we will see. The existence of a dark brown dwarf binary companion still near to our soul system is the subject of Andy Lloyd's interesting book published called The Dark Star. If this research is true, that these physicists are right, it happened around 4,000 B.C. and it was a star. It's been found in the Sumerian texts them, themselves as, a, as the explosion of a star. It absolutely undermines every theory of history academia has, has promulgated. The, the 65 million year old 
destruction of the dinosaur age, the Jurassic, the collapse of the Jurassic, the Precambrian, the Cambrian explosion. We have to reanalyze everything. It is far, there's far more evidence that these great geological time periods of millions and hundreds of millions of years ago were local time periods and they were abbreviated time periods. They were simulations, they were ecospheres and biospheres that were initiated and then collapsed, initiated and then collapsed over and over and quite rapidly and we could probably put the entire known human memory experience, every single fact we have ever delineated from our research in archaeology and probably compress it all into maybe 40,000 years. I know that sounds strange, but the facts are the facts. We're still finding live tissue in DNA specimens in the La Brea tar pits in creatures that were supposed to be dead a million years ago. We're still finding... DNA and insects that were trapped in amber a hundred million years ago. We're still pulling out genetic material from the frozen, the frozen, uh, uh, the frozen tundras and wastes of Siberia and North America where over two million megafauna were frozen, were flash frozen in place. Our, our scientific theories don't make any sense when we start analyzing what we're finding and trying to compare it with the paper models that have been pushed upon us. In 2012, when nothing happened at the supposed end of the Mayan long count, the powers that be were pleased. The public had been deceived yet again. The long count is an apocalypse calendar, but its end in 2012 was a deliberate deception. In 2011, my book, Anunnaki Homeworld, was published by Book Tree of San Diego. The year before 2012, all the craze was about speculating what was going to occur in 2012 at the end of the Maya Long Count calendar. What happened to all those authors? In Anunnaki Homeworld, I made it abundantly clear with charts, detailed proof showing that 2012 was not the end of the long count. An entire chapter packed with data revealing that the end of the long count isn't until November 2046. I'm not the first to know this either. Whoever built the Great Pyramid of Giza knew it as well. The bewildering Mayan long count calendar is not so mysterious once compared with the Annus Mundi system or year of the world chronology so popular in ancient Alexandrian texts and afterward. Scholars have determined that this old American calendar has a start date of August 12th, 3113 BC, a date that has baffled Mayan scholars. The Mayan calendar will end once 13 Bactons are completed, and incredibly, these Bactons are expansive units of time that are measured at precisely 144,000 days each. 13 epics of 144,000 days. Thus, the entire Mayan system concludes at 1,872,000 days, which reads in the calendar 13.0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. The fact that days were the prime unit of calendrical reckoning of the Maya is a common thread to the much earlier Sumerian civilization, a culture also counting their periods in days as we've discussed in prior videos. Now, this 3113 BC extends back to the year 782 before the flood, or 782 Annus Mundi, which is only 13 years prior to the date the Sumerian scholars ascribed to Etana, the Enoch of the Sumerian king list. 11 years from the start of the Brahmanic Kali Yuga Age, and again, 8 years from the beginning of the Mayan Itza Temple of the Cross calendar, which is a goddess calendar. <coughs> Excuse me. The Mayan system, as well as the others noted here, began during the reign of the prophet King Enoch, the biblical figure merely a Hebraicized version of the Sumerian Enki. Its start date in conjunction with the building of the pyramids and reign of its principal architect, Enoch, and allu allusion to a time in the, in the last days, hints that this system was intended to start at a very significant date in the beginning that commemorated another time period that was going to be disclosed in the end. And as Lost Scriptures of Giza, my book clearly demonstrates this was the chief purpose of the Great Pyramid, an apocalypse recorder and prophetic time capsule. Though antiquarians associate the Egyptian ruler Khufu with the Great Pyramid, they call him Cheops, the, the Greek version, the actual title is Maya Itza, 
It is a description of a sacred area, a ka'ufu. Though this is not to be addressed until later, we have the problem we have with modern scholarship is that the interpretation of this system's 13 Bactons ending in 2012 is because chronologists today assume the Earth's 365.25 day orbital period, making the year has always remained constant, and this is far from the truth. Recalibrating the long count to 13 Bactons of Draconian days, 360 days each, gives us 5,200 years. Exactly. 52 being the sacred number of the Maya, the Aztecs, the Quisha, the Zapotecs, uh, the Toltec, and provides us an incredible date important to our study later in these videos. The Maya considered the 365.25 day to be a vague year, and they did not factor it, and they would never have adopted the vague year for their historic and holy long count system. Even the greater sum of 144,000 days, a total back then, exhibits the use of the lower denominator of 360 because it's divisible by 360. It is not divisible by 365 or 365.25. But these facts and divisors do not only apply to the Mayan long count. The truly remarkable Brahmanic system is even closer in synchronicity to the Sumerian system than the ancient American one. The Kali Yuga age of India marks the beginning of mankind's degeneration into evil and has a start date of 3102 or 3103 BC. 11 years after the beginning of the long count. The Kali Yuga age was predicated on the idea that the age would come full circle after the end of a 6,000 year period. Note that the Kali Yuga was the fourth age of India and did not start with the beginning of Brahmanic reckoning. The proximity of these start dates is laden with implications. All four of these references, the Temple of the Cross, the Mayan Long Count, the Etana Record, and the Brahmanic, Brahmanic Calendar all fall within a 21-year period that we have shown in a prior video, perfectly averaging out at 800 years Annus Mundi. If we conclude that the Mayan Temple of the Cross calendar was designed to start contemporaneously with the Long Count instead of seven years priorly, at one time they were obviously the same calendar. And this conclusion is not without further confirmation from the Maya themselves. The Maya Temple of the Cross calendar has been assigned a start date of 3121 BC, or 774 AM, Annus Mundi. And the Maya records claim the system began with the ascension of a goddess from the earth who is represented by a rather grotesque glyph. The inscriptions in the temple reads that Lady Beast with upturned snout was over 800 years old at the time of her ascension. The ascension of a deity is preserved in the ascent of Enoch. However, an 800-year-old woman was not uncommon during those days prior to the flood, according to ancient sources, especially Genesis and, the, and even the Sumerian king list, which has rulers living for long periods of time. Not the Sitchin corrupted hundreds of thousands of years, but the but 120 years and 128 years and 140 years. Uh, but we've already covered those issues in prior videos. Before the deluge, the goddess was the chief object of worship as, as it tested around the world among the earliest sites. It was after the flood that the patriarchal societies became dominant and turned goddesses into gods. The 800-year reference uh, uh, could refer to 800 Annus Mundi, or the 800 could be a numerical disguise for the eight kings because the lady beast is no doubt equated with the Sumerian Babel, uh, Babylonian dragon Tiamat, the seven-headed dragon that supports the eighth. In the biblical apocalyptic book of Revelation, she is called Mystery Babylon and the Harlot. Now you have to understand, this, is, this equates to ancient hate speech. This is patriarchal priesthoods demonizing the older goddess cult. Now, are we to delegate this as mere coincidence? Are we to assume Mayan records in the Temple of the Cross any less accurate than the scientific calculations in the Mayan, Mayan Dresden Codex that contain Venus almanacs so precise they ensure an accuracy of within two hours in 500 years of, of Venus calculations? Are we, to, are we to be that hypocritical? We are reminded here of a most truthful statement made by Robert Beach Stacy Judd in 1939 when he wrote that beneath the stories of world mythology there is truth veiled in various disguises and by careful comparison with somewhat analogous accounts from widely scattered areas fundamental characteristics frequently show remarkable parallels. If therefore extraneous data disclose that a certain amount of fact underlies most myths and legends let us, for the time being, 
consider them as a medium of information, subject to the more definite acceptance of substantiation through other sources. Keeping this in mind, we note that the Mayan and Brahmanic histories are fused together by the goddess motif, for the Kali Yuga was modeled after the Indian goddess of destruction, Kali. She had eight arms, matriarchal memory of the Scorpion King, and was a frenzied, bloody woman with weapons of war in each hand. Other Native American cultures, probably distantly related to the Maya, maintained traditions concerning Spider Woman, who was linked to the number eight, an arachnid having eight legs, and the creative power of weaving webs. In early Mexico, the spider was, was the surrogate of evil and cold, known as the arch deceiver and enemy of mankind. The mother-goddess connection is prevalent everywhere in the early Americas, the genetrix of a malign race of stone giants. These giants sought to exterminate mankind before they were hurled over the great abyss. The Aztecs tell of these giants during the reign of Taloc, the Mexican Enoch, a man who lived for 364 years until an evil goddess began to rule the world and the world was destroyed by a flood. This is a direct reference to Enoch who lived 365 years before being translated into heaven to vanish. The 364 recalled simply because it aligns with the Mexican calendars which are divisible by 52. 52 times 7 is 364. The goddess's name wa was Iskuna, and she is faulted for the great flood. She further being remembered as being representative by a constellation that had fallen from the sky. Very interesting, because we find the exact same reference in the old Jewish Haggadoth records of a constellation vanishing from the sky before the flood. This primordial woman that caused the deluge is told of in Old Cornwall, Wales, and Brittany, as well as across the globe in early Persia. The Hopi too remembered a wicked goddess who had access to a ladder that reached the world's axis. Now remember, the world's axis, axis mundi, has always been a reference to the Great Pyramid Complex. These details are distinctly Euphratian in origin. Ishtar of the Babylonians and Inanna of Sumer were also identified with ladders that reached heaven and were both connected to flood myths involving divine necklaces with beads, blue beads, lapis lazuli, that represented the Anunnaki. Another title for Inanna was Aruru, and she had a necklace of lapis lazuli beads similar to the divine necklace of jewels worn by the Japanese goddess Amaterusa. This Japanese story tells that after the passage of seven generations, which would be during the eighth one, of gods appear the Iz Izanagi and the Izanami. These beings are no doubt a corruption of the Sumerian Anunnaki, or Anunnaki, the Anuna. Now, Izanami is merely a Japanese female version of Izanagi. The goddess associated to the seven in Egypt was called Sefnet Abut, the goddess of the laying down of the foundation of the repetitions of seven, the guardian of the cycles of 30 and 120 years, a Sumerian shar, a great shar. Over her head was a seven-rayed ray, star, and about her neck was a rainbow scholars identify as the same symbol of Ishtar's collar of jewels. The seven-pointed star, as seen in my book, The Lost Scriptures of Giza, was important to the architectural mechanics of the Great Pyramid, for the seven-pointed star provides a perfect 52-degree angle, and 120 is the Sumerian Great Shar in use when the pyramid complex was constructed upon the firm foundation in Egypt at Giza. It's 52-degree degree angle slope, making it the most unique pyramid in the world. Even in late Greek antiquity, this mythos was still circulating. It was said that a god of, for of foraging made a wonderful necklace and it was given to Harmonia, a goddess. Despite its divine origin, the necklace was to bring about the end of a later generation. We will soon revisit this goddess of the antediluvian world. The primordial genetrix, the goddess of all the antediluvian religions, who reappears in the last day's prophetic imagery of the Revelation, which was copied from the older Sibylline oracles and Sibylline prophecies, the ancient Greek prophecies, and reappeared in our apocalypse, riding upon a seven-headed beast. She was the matriarch before those seven Anunnaki kings who claimed descent from her. Let us now explore who these regents were to the ancient world in, in, a, in, the, in the next video. Again, 
we will be, be visiting the antiquity of the goddess in future videos. But what must be understood here is remember, I remind you constantly that we're looking at ancient history through the lens that they appropriated it uh, to us. We're not really looking at it in the vein that it happened. What I'm seeing here is that the Anunnaki patriarch, the uh, patriarchal society, totally, totally robbed the matriarchal, matriarchal government of its uh, prestige by claiming descent. Evidently, there was so much opposition to the coming of the Anuna and into their, their form and style of government, which is basically overthrowing the traditions and lifestyles of the matriarchy, that they had to claim descent from the great matriarch herself in order to establish the veracity of their dynasty. So what we are left here is that a political controversy, also a racial controversy, occurred before the flood. The Anuna, the Caucasian branches of the human race, took the political reins and government away from the matriarchy, who were not Caucasian, and they began to rule. But in order to get people to, to fall in line, they claimed descent from the goddess. Now, what we have is a, a transfer of power to the patriarchy, the Anuna, the Anunnaki, and this transfer of power basically basically lasted 4,500 years or so. However, there's going to be a complete reversal or a semi-reversal in the last days. And during the apocalypse, there will be a return of the goddess worship.